So yeah, 20 times the log of 1600 volts over 0.04 volts. Yep. Yes, that would make a difference. If you did, well, if you did 10, that should work. If you did 10 times the log, 1600 squared divided by 0.04 squared, it should come out exactly the same. You see, I get the exact same result. Did you square those two by themselves and then round I was going to say, neither one of those would round real. Unless you find the flip side, then it'd be way off. And it should be way off. It'd be a negative then. Yep, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll answer any questions you have on them first to so make sure everybody's got them. Yep. If it's milliwatts, it's 10 log. Oh, to solve it? Oh, sure. Well, what's weird for a lot of people is you might have like a negative 21 dB. Let's put a dBmV. And a lot of people know negative 21. Well, how can you have a negative power? Well, that's actually a positive voltage. Sure. And a negative signal just means that the voltage is less, a negative power just means that the voltage is less than one millivolt, or the wattage is less than one milliwatt. It's still a positive signal level if it's less than one millivolt. Somebody's still wrong on number 10. 12? Yep. And number 12. Yeah, if you got something like this and you go to solve it, of course, you got to divide by the 20. It's got negative 1.05. Yeah, and this is where you, to get, now once you got the log by itself, this is where you do 10 to the power of, cancels out the log. Just 10. Yeah. Thanks, sir. So it's actually 0 0.089 <coughs> millivolts is your signal, even though it's a negative reading. Just get rid of this and put it as V. As long as you remember that your units have to be in millivolts, you can get rid of it as V. Basically, whatever you get there is going to answer the power matches from millivolts. Yes. <clears throat> you just know when you're dealing with power, you're either dealing with millivolts or milliwatts, period. <coughs> How are you guys feeling about the transmission problem? <laughs> so let's say that we have 
Uh, this is coming in as 0.95 millivolts is your signal antenna. 9 dB per 100 feet is our loss in the cable. So let's say we've got 80 feet of cable here, 30 feet, 20 feet, and 20 feet. This here is an amplifier of a plus 8 dB. This here is going to be a 9 dB loss. And this is going to be a plus, oh, what do I want to put in there? Well, that is a plus 15 dB amplifier. So to deal with this, we need to convert our signal over to dBs. What's my formula going to be? It's already in millivolts. I gave you this 0.95 instead of 950 micro. So 20 times the log. And here's, I do the same thing what you had said. I usually just put in the 0.95. I don't put in the divide by one. Negative 0.4455. DBMV, yes. And the nice thing about DBMV is a lot of people say, well, DBMV, DBM, DBs, they're different. But DBMV is the power of a DB, the DBMV will vary with DBs just like any other power level. Yep, we can just add and subtract regular DBs to it. Oh, sure. So here we're going to add the plus 8 and the plus 15, that's a plus 23. We're going to subtract. We have the minus 9. The, yeah, we've got added up. This is 150 feet of cable here. So 150 times 9 per 100 is 13.5. So that's subtracting 22.5. These are both dBs. So that is a net positive 23, negative 22.5 is a net gain of 0.5 dB. So we come up here and we add 0.5 dB. That puts us at a positive 0 0.0545 dBmV. So that has to be converted. <coughs> yes, sir. Yep. So this is a negative. Oh, sorry. Yep. So again, I'm just going to take that. 0 0.0545 divided by 20 I get my answer there then that is 10 to the power of that so 1.006 millivolts is my voltage here's one that always kind of weirds people out Does 0 dB mean you have no signal? Exactly. 0 dB is exactly 1 milliwatt or 1 millivolt. And that's a tough one for a lot of people to wrap their head around. Is... Yeah. Well, it's, it's always, it has to be, because it's on a logarithmic scale, it has to be compared to another number. The weird thing about dBs, um, let's say that we have your signal goes from 20 milliwatts to 
40 milliwatts. Your dB gain Oh, I put milliliters there. That should be milliwatts. It's been one of those days. So it's the, the out over the in. Yeah, it's just going to be 10 times the log 40 over 20. Should be 3.01. If it goes from 0.2 milliwatts to 0.4 milliwatts, <clears throat> 10 times the log of 0.4 over 0.2 is still 3.01 dB. And that's one of those things that really feels strange to a lot of people. We go from 0.4 to 0.8. We just went from 0.2 to 0.4, and that was 3.01. 0.4 to 0.8 is still going to be 3.01, because it once again doubled. Careful. It's four times it's six. In fact, we can look at that. Let's say we go from... Five milliwatts to forty milliwatts. Ten would be doubling once, so that's plus three three point oh one or three. Twenty would be doubling again, so that's another three, so that's six point oh two or just six. 40 is doubling again, so that's just 9.03, or plus 9 dB. So from 5 to 40 is just 9 dB. In fact, what you can do, um, the shortcut? Kind of. Kind of. 40 divided by 5 is 8, right? 8 is 2 to the power of 3. So that means it's doubled 3 times. So it's 3 times 3 dB. It's a 9 dB gain. 10 is a 9.03 dB gain. Let's say we go from 2 milliwatts to... 128 milliwatts. Milliwatts again. So 128 milliwatts over 2 milliwatts. That's gone up 64 times. 64 is 2 to the power of 6. With 18 dB gain. Whatever the, the ratio... Whatever that power of 2 is, it would give you the same ratio. Now that only works if it comes out to an even power of 2. What the power of 2 are, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's say it goes from 30 milliwatts up to 200. 
that divides out, that's going to be like 6.67 is the ratio. So what we can say is that's between 4 and 8. 4 is 2 squared, 8 is 2 to the third. So that's going to be between 6 and 9 dB. It's a pretty good size gap, but at least you know it's going to be between there. Uh, it's just a matter of, I do estimates like that just so I know where it's going to come out before I calculate it. So, I mean, you've seen me hit some wrong buttons on my calculator and not catch it. By knowing what the answer is supposed to be, I know that, oh, something didn't go right there. i got to go back and redo it. But yeah, that, that uh, logarithmic scale is really kind of interesting. Um, earthquakes go off the same thing. You know, the, the Richter scale. You know, I'm not really sure. Let's let's take a peek. That's where you do the F scale, aren't you? Well, let's see what Wikipedia has to say. It's off the damage, it's not necessarily the wind speed. Well, here, the, the enhanced scale, they've got the, the damages associated with the wind speed. Uh, let's see what it says here. Yeah, these don't, these are, this is not a logarithmic scale. It does kind of, but it's not quite. Yeah. Six. It's kind of funny because the scale actually goes up to an F12, and I don't think that they've never registered anything above an F5, I don't believe. An F12, um, I do know that the wind speeds were developed. The F12 is the speed of sound. Well, here, speed of sound at a Negative 3 Celsius, what is that? Is that 20 degrees? Negative 3 Celsius, that's like 25 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 degrees Fahrenheit. And I don't know why that temperature was selected, because it is below freezing, but it's kind of an interesting scale, but it's not truly logarithmic. Yes, it does. Temperature, it's, it's not necessarily the temperature, but it's the density of the mm -hmm. air. Yeah. The more humid it is and the colder it is, the faster sound will travel. The higher the density of the air, the faster the sound travels. Well, if you have an antenna, you're saying that's as far as like percentage wise, like you need to be like how much you need to be It It can't, it can't, well, it can't, no, it, it can very much. The density of the air causes the waves. It, it can actually, uh, it varies enough that it actually causes weird things where if, if you've got, <coughs> like if you have a, a high density air or a cold air mass, so let's just look at the region. Let's say you've got a cold air, cold air mass here hitting a warm air mass here. It varies enough that, let's say you've got a sound source here that's emitting sound. When that sound hits here, it actually accelerates enough that it can actually cause it to go out 
What's hitting straight on will go straight on, but the rest of it will actually re refract or bend. And it actually causes dead zones here on the other side of the air mass where you cannot, cannot hear that sound. It's kind of weird. The study of acoustics is really a, a cool science. Okay. Well, if you guys are satisfied with that quiz, I'll get that graded and back to you guys tomorrow, hopefully. Let's take a look then at our new stuff, or that new quiz, quiz test, I should say. Thanks, sir. You know, I don't write with pencil hardly at all. This, on the construction side, I'll write with a pencil just because the pen doesn't last very long. But you know, yeah, no, it's good. if the wood is wet, it does. If the wood is dry, it works okay. Yeah, I, I used to use that all the time. Yeah. Uh, well, the the key, key is just don't make it, the key is just don't make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not that hard to fix. <laughs> Or write it on scratch paper until you're sure you got the answer right, then write it in. As you can tell, I'm not that neat and organized of a person, so you don't really have to hide it from me. So anyway, what we're going to be looking at in this next unit is we're going to be looking at the start of trig. And as we start trig, a lot of people view trig as the study of triangles, and it's not. Um, as we're going to see over the next few classes, it's the study of circles. But we are going to start talking about triangles a little bit here. So that we're ready for it when it comes. So a triangle is made up of six parts. We will label the three angles with capital letters. Typically A, B, and C. And the three sides will be labeled with corresponding letters, but they'll be small letters. And side A will be the side that is across from angle A, like that. So there's two ways to think of it. It's across from angle A, or it's the only side that does not touch angle A. Side B, then, is across from angle B. Side C, then, is across from angle C. Again, the only side that doesn't touch angle C. The reason the sides are correlated this way is because if I keep C and B the same, the size of side A changes with the size of angle A. If I make angle A smaller, side A gets smaller. If I make angle A bigger, side A gets bigger. So there is that direct link between them. When I am looking at these triangles, one thing I know about them, if I tell you that this angle here is 61 degrees, and this angle here is 82 degrees, how do I find this angle down here? Careful. You're thinking sides. The angles of a triangle. The angle sum has to add up to... 180 degrees. So I can either do 82 plus 61 or I can just do 180 minus 82 minus 61, which is going to give me 37 degrees for this angle. Some relationships we may have seen before, hopefully. A square corner is called a right angle or 90 degrees. An angle that is smaller than 90 degrees or smaller than a right angle is called acute. An angle that's larger is called obtuse. Very good. Actually, you've heard the words an acute thinker or an obtuse thinker. An acute thinker is somebody who focuses in and sees just a very narrow strip, does not see the related things around it, 
but focus in and can see all the very little details within that narrow strip. An obtuse thinker is somebody that sees the big picture but can't focus in on little details. If I tell you that this angle here is 29 degrees, what's that one have to be? 90 minus 29, or 61 degrees. When two angles add up to 90 degrees, they are said to be complementary. This is going to be very important in our trig. Complementary angles have special relationships. The other one that's going to be big If I tell you that this is 57 degrees, what's this angle have to be? 180 minus 57, or yes, 123 degrees. When two angles add up to 180 degrees, they're said to be supplementary. Um, supplementary angles in trig have very important relationships with with their functions. I take a trip. Sure. Just on this stuff? Have a quiz? Call her a day? Yep. <laughs> hey, I Actually. Geometry. <laughs> this is easy. Yeah, I didn't pay attention. You want to don't go <laughs> any further. Are you saying I'm going to make it worse? <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> You're starting to get to know me. <laughs> exactly. Starts all good, but then it gets bad. Okay, so let's say this one here is 6 inches, 10 inches, and 12 inches. This triangle is just an enlargement of that one. It's been blown up. You can tell because the angles are marked. You know, these two angles are the same, and these two are the same. And if two out of the three angles are the same between triangles, the third one has to be because of that angle sum of 180. But let's say I know that this side here is 15 inches, which that 15 corresponds to which side of the first triangle? The 10. Good. So we call this one x and y. How do I find x and y? I know what they are. Okay. Well, 10. 10 corresponds to the 15. Right? 10 goes to 15. 6 will go to x. So we can just cross multiply and divide in our proportion. 9 times, or 15 times 6 is 90. Divided by 10 is 9. So x is 9. Which you had that one, right? And 10 still goes to 15. 12 goes to y. Now you have to be careful here. You know, the 10 corresponds to 15 because they're the same side just before or after it's been enlarged. The 10 and 12 go together because they're from the same triangle. The 15 and y go together because they're from the same triangle. So you have to have those relationships in both directions. And then, of course, we'll cross, multiply, and divide. 15 times 12 is 180. Divided by 10 is going to be 18. So y is 18 inches. Make sense? And then, of course, this is the one Mike was thinking of earlier. If 
if I have a right triangle and I want to find one of the missing sides, of course, the hypotenuse is la labeled side C. The right angle is usually labeled, labeled angle C. The other two angles are called angles A and B. So which one is going to be side A, the 8 or the 15? The 8. Good. And B is the 15. A and B are what are called legs. C is the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the side that's across from the right angle. It will always be the longest side. And think about it. If a triangle only has 180 degrees, a 90 degree angle has to be the biggest angle because there's only 90 degrees left and that's got to be split between two angles somehow. So that'll be the longest side, side C. The 90 degree angle will be the biggest angle. A and B are the legs. I always remember that because a right angle forms an L. L for legs. So they form the L. So A and B are the legs. So the length of one leg squared plus the length of the other leg squared has to equal the length of our hypotenuse squared. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So then 8 squared plus 15 squared equals C squared. 8 squared is 64. 15 squared is 225. Get confused. No, the hypot it's only a hypotenuse if it's a right triangle. Sure. Okay. You bet. So then 64 and 225 is 289 equals C squared. To solve for C, got to square root. So C here is going to be 17. And of course, the units will be the same as the other units. So that's 17 inches. And of course, that can work forward or back. You might have a triangle. Like that. I'll call this one X for the missing side. Which side is going to be the hypotenuse? 25, that's side C. So the other two are legs. It doesn't matter which one I call which. A and B really don't matter. So A squared is going to be 7 squared. Plus B squared is going to be X squared. Equals C squared. It'll be 25 squared. 7 squared is 49. 25 squared is 625. Now I have to solve the equation. I'm going to subtract the 49. So x squared equals 576. And then a square root. Square root of 576 is 24. So it's 24. For you guys, not nearly as much as for the wood students. Um, the wood students do a lot of that calculation, squaring up a building, you know, setting a foundation. You run your strings to do a foundation. So you're going to measure corner to corner here to see if that matches up with what it should be. I mean, you can always set all four sides and measure corner to corner and see if they're the same and adjust. But it's nice if you can just put two sides up and get it close first and then you don't have to adjust quite as much later. Okay. Um, I believe I've got to give you guys a packet here. Page 472 in this packet is going to be exercise 20-7 1 through 19 the odd. Page 
497, exercise 22-7, 1 through 13 the odd, and page 512, exercise 23-3, 1 through 9 the odd. I'll grab this package. This packet went last a while. Ooh. Good. Good. 